I just want to recognize Andrew Lamar Hopkins, who was here with us and generously donated his piece for the auction. So Andrew, if you could stand up and wave to everyone. Thank you so much for your donation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Keith. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. And um, I want to thank the the Garden Study Club for inviting me to New Orleans. I said, like most of all the rest of us, I haven't really been anywhere and apart from home in the last 15 or 16 months. I just told Frog, I don't even think I've spoken to anybody in the last year. So if I fumble and stumble around, please, please forgive me. Uh, but it's so wonderful. I'm ecstatic that y'all invited me here and to be here in New Orleans. I'm so in love with this city and uh, it's been far too long. Um, Anyway, I'm happy to celebrate spring and what a glorious day we've got outside and to talk to you about a couple of things that, uh, that bring us joy and those would be beautiful rooms and beautiful flowers. And uh, just look at all the displays upstairs, uh, all the creativity and effort and, and, and beauty that they put together up there. They're all awfully lovely to see. And I honestly don't know much of anything that has captured the fascination of humankind for as long as as, mu as much as flowers have. Their, their kaleidoscopic colors, their beautiful fragrances, their, their, their um, intriguing shapes. And um, certainly in my business, floral motifs have been a mainstay since the appearance of chintzes in the 18th century. They say that the, um, the pendulum of, of decorating trends are swinging back and that we're seeing lots more color, lots more pattern, and lots more chintzes even reappearing, ones that are being printed again from archives and things. But um, I've really never set them aside in all the time I've been decorating. Um, as everybody probably knows, I have a lifelong love affair with brown furniture and chintz, and I have a very special bolt of it in my closet that I'm going to be buried in. <laughs> so I, I was just going to show you. I don't know if I know how to do this. I guess I go that way. How do you do this? Oh, so roses are red, violets are blue. I hope. So I was going to just show you a few of my favorites. This is uh, Imperial Garden by Schumacher, um, called Majestic Garden. I'm sorry, based on a 19th century French document. Just beautiful, glorious, big peonies and birds. This is a chintz called Pullbrook, Pullbrook Bouquet reprinted uh, from the document by Hazelden House, and it's flowers and garlands characteristic of the work of Pullbrook and Gould, floral decorators for the royal family for half a century, and the Lady Pullbrook Floral School in London, which is world renowned. But this screen, this screen has 88 different screens in it. It's absolutely beautiful. This is called Homage to Rose Cumming, the flamboyant American decorator who was the first woman to really work in the, in the field of interior design as we know it. Um, just a beautiful, voluptuous cabbage rose chintz. Here we've got uh, honeysuckle from Colfax and Fowler, which has become a classic, and uh, people are using this again. It comes in this original colorway with these beautiful limey greens and butterflies. This is a chintz called Tuileries, Les Tuileries, and uh, it was, is printed by Scalamandre, and it was used for bed hangings by Evangeline Bruce, Bunny Mellon, who Margot mentioned earlier, her, she had a bed hung in a canopy bed. And then they were both mentors of Jacqueline Onassis and Jackie had this same chintz in her, uh, on her bed. In fact, the exact same bed. This is uh, again, an old fashioned chintz called Arbor Japonaise from Brunswick. It's been printed since the fifties and they still make it today. Just a beautiful, beautiful watery print. This is Lee Jofa's gorgeous Tree of Life, and it's sold in big panels because it has like a six-foot repeat. And they say it has 365 different blocks, one for each day of the year. Um, but it, 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 one for each day of the year, it has a hundred-inch repeat, and the colors are saturated and jewel-like. And I said, so are your eyes when you have to write the check to pay for it. <laughs> That's the only thing with these beautiful hand block chintzes there. This is my absolute favorite. This is called a um, tribute to John Fowler, again by Hazelton House. Beautiful, beautiful hand block linen, which is just exuberant and happy. And um, 
anyway, it uh, is a good harbinger of spring. It's great to be um, again here today with that beautiful weather outside and to start to celebrate spring with you all. Um, this is a scene from New York in all its glory. Um, and I love the quote, that spring can show us what God can do with a drab and dirty world. And God knows, leaving this, hopefully leaving this hideous epidemic behind us, it's just so wonderful um, to be out and about and, and, and embrace the world again and not be sort of cloistered at home, um, even though that's a good place to be. Uh, it, it's made me think a lot, as I think all of us have, about things that are important and things that, to, 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 that we should really appreciate and we should really not take for granted ever again. Um, and one of those things are... Um, the tradespeople and people who do, um, again, it's like standing before you here today as a decorator, I couldn't do anything that I do if it weren't for the able and talented hands behind me who make all this fluff and stuff happen. This is Audrey, one of my, one of my seamstresses in New York who makes the most beautiful curtains you've ever seen. And the artisans, carpenters, builders, upholsterers, craftsmen, um, it just shows us how vital they are to creating this beauty and, and how important it is to keep these trades alive and how grateful we are for those who do. Um, I am a frustrated couturier. I'd much rather make dresses than curtains, but these are just some beautiful curtains that I've made, these chocolate brown ones um, hanging from a serpentine gilded palmet or on a, an, in a dining room, Park Avenue with a beautiful Bessarabian floral carpet underneath it belonged to Brooke Astor. And then this is my friend Allison Kendrick's house here in New Orleans, which is beautiful, and we sort of were inspired by the curtains of Nancy Lancaster's design, and they're made in unlined silk, but just beautifully made and beautifully detailed. There's nothing like it. This is an apartment that we did recently in New York City and just shows you all these guys so fast at work. We were on a huge deadline, and I conceived they had this great coromandel screen hanging on the wall, and so I designed this sofa that was 14 and a half feet long. Well, little do I realize we get to the apartment and it won't fit in the elevator, through the window, over the roof, whatever. So it's sitting out on the street for about a day and a half. So finally, we got the sofa doctor in New York to come slice it in two. We bring it into the apartment in pieces, and so we had to completely, my guys came and completely rebuilt and reupholstered the thing on the spot. And there it sits in all its glory. Sadly, though, my client sold this apartment and moved to Charleston, and so we had to come chop it back into three pieces <laughs> to take it back out. So he spent more on that sofa than he did on the apartment. <laughs> this is another uh, little bit of a calamity. I've been lucky enough to work on the most beautiful house in Charleston on the High Battery the last three years, my clients done a major restoration of a, the, the big pink house in Charleston. You probably may know it. it uh, it's on East Battery. Um, it was owned by only two families. They called the Ravenel House originally. But I bought this incredible English Regency chandelier in London, pitched a fit for my client to buy it, jumping up and down, saying, you've got to buy this most beautiful thing you've ever seen. It has a cut glass pineapple in the center of it, whatever. It, just, it belongs in Charleston, whatever. I neglected to tell our master restorers and builders that it weighed eight and a half tons. So when it was shipped over, he goes, Keith, we, that chandelier's not going to hang from that ceiling. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. And we just spent months restoring the plaster medallions or whatever. So I said, Moby, you've got to figure out a way to hang it. Come on, you've got to do this. And so... <laughs> He goes to the guest bedroom upstairs, chops a huge hole in the ceiling, puts all this steel and blocking and everything, fills that back in, puts the rug on top, and up goes the chandelier. <laughs> May I be careful when you eat under it. But you can see the dining room <laughs> coming together uh, around it. Beautiful. I had Gracie paint um, scenes of Charleston and the harbor and the bombing of Fort Sumter. And we even put, you see on the far left, we even put the Ravenel Bridge. Um, crossing over, so it's, it, and we did it all in tones of kind of tobacco and sepia. It's very successful. It looks like it's been there for a while. Nothing like those houses in Charleston, except houses in New Orleans, right? They're just as pretty here. And also, the next thing I'm sort of thinking I'm thankful for are my mentors. Um, I was lucky enough when I got off the Greyhound bus in New York City to get my first job with Mark Hampton, but I worked for the longest time for uh, Keith Irvin and Tom Fleming at a firm called Irvin and Fleming, and Keith was Scottish. He trained under, uh, under John Fowler in London, 
and then he moved to New York, worked brief, briefly for Sister Parish, and then started his own business. And he was very instrumental in sort of spreading and making popular the English country style in America in the eight, late 80s and early 90s, and introduced a lot of chintzes that had never been seen in America before, and he just did beautiful, classic English country house decorating. He was obsessed with the South. He was, and he, and in fact, Sam Blunt, who knows, Olivia knows well, and um, who's from Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I, he had always Southern assistance. He loved that, and he loved anything to do with the South, and his favorite um, movie was Gone with the Wind. So we would travel all around the world doing these grand installations for these beautiful houses all around, and his favorite moment every time, whenever he got near a grand staircase, he loved to come sweeping down and proclaim, we show is rich now. <laughs> Then, my, um, again, before I even knew what bullion fringe was, I uh, finagled myself in 1979 a ticket to the, to the fancy opening of the Kipps Bay Decorator Show House. And uh, I never really knew who Mark Hampton was. So I go in and I'm absolutely gobsmacked by this, this black room. It's almost te like, like dark, dark, dark black, uh, uh, dark brown, it's almost black. And Mark had put, you can't, it's a terrible picture, but it was this huge drawing room in a big fancy townhouse and had sisal all over the floor and all the furniture, before anybody really knew what sisal was, and all the furniture's covered in, in um, creamy um, cotton rep, and then he filled it with this beautiful William Kent furniture and fancy paintings and all. And anyway, I was, I was just taken, taken beyond with that, and I was lucky enough to, after a lot of persistence, to... Um, got a job as an apprentice in his office and worked there for a couple of years running errands for him. But 25 years later, I did my own version of this black room for a lovely couple, great clients of mine in Greenwich, Connecticut. And we did, anyway, my version of it. And we, the, the star of the show are these beautiful Irish bookcases. They were a pair of these, these bookcases that we bought in London at Bonhams and had them restored and shipped over here. And they kind of made the room. But you, black rooms are really, a, deep color I think is always good because it makes the walls kind of recede in a room and it makes you sort of look into the wall and sort of instead of at it. And I think they create atmosphere and, and, and without, um, in a way that you don't realize until you're in the room, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> anyway, here we also appreciate home. Um, this is my crazy house that I owned for 20 years out in, on the east end of Long Island in Watermill. And I, this house was derelict. I had seen it for several years before I finally was lucky enough to be able to buy it. We started a renovation of it, just a general renovation because I wanted it to still appear old and friendly and sort of crooked. And I love these colors and I worked very hard on these, these, these colors, this dark color on the shingle because the shingle had been sort of stained and worn and, and, and it needed to be unified by a color, but I didn't want to paint just another white house with green shutters. My neighbor, who I'd not met, because we used to have wild parties in, in those days, so she hated us anyway, um, she comes and knocks on my door when the final paint is going up and she said, hi, and she introduced herself, you're Mr. Langham, and I go, yes, and she said, I'm so-and-so from across the street and here's an apple pie and, and that I made and here's some flowers from our garden and we want to welcome you to the neighborhood. And she said, I hear you're a decorator of note. And I go, well, I guess so. And she said, well, we've watched the renovation of the house and she goes, these are your test colors, right? I go, no, 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 these, these are colors that I'm, I'm, the house is finished, this is the paint color. And she, I said, I call it creosote and boil shrimp. And she took two steps back from me and looked me in the square in the face and she said, well, Mr. Langham, let me be the first to tell you, you are destroying a perfectly beautiful Victorian. <laughs> anyway, it's funny. I don't think we ever spoke again for 22 years. But those are my hydrangeas. They were kind of my pride and joy. Uh, and, you know, anything, I mean, I'm not a gardener uh, by any means, but, you know, it's the climate on the east end of Long Island is like England. Anything just grows if you look at it. Um, this is a shot, too, from Margot's book, um, a shot of a lunch party on my uh, porch. And then, again, those hydrangeas are just unbelievable. I think they're called Annabelle. Um, and you see my creosote and boil shrimp shutters. <laughs> Another shot of the porch. 
This is my little house, which is where I used to live, and uh, which was separate from the house. I'd fill the house with guests and company all the time, and then I would stay out in the what it used to, what used to be the garage, and never been happier. <laughs> this was our little tent, which we we built out by the little square swimming pool, and I bought those flamingos at the uh, Kmart in Los Angeles, and they arrived with broken necks. So I looked up the SKU number, and they only had two pair left up in somewhere near Albany. So I drove for six hours and got the, the last pair they had of these $195 pink flamingos. But they were made out of concrete, so they were fabulous. So now I'm also thankful for all my clients. I've been very fortunate to work for lovely people, and you form such a bond with people when you're, when you're working so closely with them for so long. Um, we used to say it takes a year and a half to do houses. Now it seems to be taking 10 years. But um, just show, show you here a few of my favorite rooms. This is a, uh, a beautiful house in Hattiesburg, Mississippi that I did with Lewis Graber, um, an architect who trained under Coke and Wilson here. The walls were done by a fellow called Bruce Nettles from Natchez, and they're this beautiful French pickle process where he wets the, the cypress and he scrapes the pulp out of the wood with wire brushes, and then he puts sheetrock mud and stains and honey and all this other stuff, and then ends up waxing them, and it's just the most beautiful finish that mellows over time. And then we just fill the room with really, really handsome English furniture. This is a screen porch off the back with these wonderful wicker chairs. There's a, a woman called Leslie Curtis up in Maine who makes these great wicker reproductions. These are fabulous old, like Lloyd Loom, I guess you call them those tall back, fan back chairs. They're really great. Uh, this is a bedroom in that same house, which I love, and a bed after a, after a design by Thomas Chippendale that we bought in England. Beautiful old needlepoint rug. Um, Again, chintz on a couple of the pieces of furniture, beautiful aquamarine um, wallpaper from Colfax and Fowler, and then the curtains we did here were unlined silk that I embroidered on the edge, and then she has motorized curtains of a heavy uh, French matelassé underneath them, so you can hit the button and black, you know, darken the room. And but in the daytime, it's so beautiful with the light coming through that that aquamarine silk. There's nothing prettier. Again rather do dresses and curtains. This is a, a, another room I just did for a friend in um, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the middle of Amish country, believe it or not. And again, just a really pretty living room, a rug that I had made in India. I'm very proud of that rug. I think it's really beautiful. It's this enormous overscale paisley um, pattern, and it's made of like a loop and a clipped kind of cotton chenille. Um, she did call me last week and told me that if you move the furniture, the rug is purple. But other than that, I think it's fading. It's not color fast at all. So I'm a little bit in trouble there. But I told her to flip it over. <laughs> we can use it on the reverse, maybe. <laughs> this is her pretty dining room, um, which we painted this ceiling kind of a black green, a chandelier I bought from Kevin Stone um, here in New Orleans. I think we bought the chairs, too, from Kyle's in the French Quarter, and um, wonderful portrait over the um, fireplace. And we did the walls, you can see, we did this a, a rendition of this um, climbing hydrangea wallpaper. And that's the wallpaper that was made by Hope Irwin. And it's, again, I'm back to Gone with the Wind. It was in the, the house in Atlanta on the staircase, the wallpaper. Um, and this was in, in, the, from, in the movie. But anyway, I had Gracie paint this green version of it and we just did sort of a bigger, bolder scale of it. This is her kitchen, which I love, which we did a Cotswold, Cotswold style floor with three different, different, different color stones sort of randomly laid. We painted the whole kitchen this sort of boysenberry color. I bought that painting from Suzanne Reinstein, who, from New Orleans, and uh, from her shop in, in LA. Of that, it's a naive sort of French folk painting of figs and butterflies and hornets. I think it's, I love that painting. Beautiful big English Regency table, ladder back chairs with rush seats. It's just a nice, friendly kitchen. This is the, her dressing room in the same house, which again, we did that John Fowler, uh, tribute to John Fowler chintz on most of the furniture. The room is this vivid chartreuse color, and her clothes hang behind all these curtained openings 
uh, with like a double-faced organza with a, a, that citrony green behind it. And then she has all these beautiful drawers with all her collection of Verdura jewelry, which I'm, I'm a great fan of his jewelry designs. I just love looking at that picture. I think it's great. This is that apartment where the sofa got butchered a million times in New York, with just a beautiful New York living room. It's on about the fourth floor of a really nice building. It has beautiful views outside. We inherited that boiserie that was original to the apartment and painted it kind of a French gray with this dusty sort of gold and silver um, picked out decoration and a beautiful Mahal rug and just a nice pretty living room. The, the, the chairs had belonged to Albert Hadley, those um, oval back leather chairs. This is a library in that same apartment where again I did a dark ceiling, dark sort of midnight blue and this beautiful long sofa with bolsters. That one I did not have to cut in, into pieces. Um, and I love the embroidered curtains here. They have a big wide embroidered band on them. Again, that same sort of French gray on the boiserie. This is a great apartment on Central Park South uh, in a building called the Gainsborough Studios, named for the English painter and built at the turn of the century and they're these tall artist studio apartments and just beautiful double height. And this one sits, the building is smack in the middle of Central Park. So you have Fifth Avenue on one side and, 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 and Central Park West on the other and then the park in between. And it's just beautiful. You can open these French doors and, and, and watch the seasons change. It's just lovely. I, I, I wish, it, I call this in my book a bedroom and a ballroom because it really is just this room and then a a bedroom on the back. So it's kind of, I think, ideal. Um, but that's the bedroom on the back of this house, which my client there had always had lavender bedrooms since the time she was a young girl. So she always, everything we've ever, I've done several houses for her and every time she, we don't even have to think about it. She said, you know, we always had to do a lavender bedroom. There's something nice about that kind of longevity and things. Um, and then last, I'm thankful that, that for my most famous client, and has everybody heard these stories ad nauseum, Jackie Onassis, who I stalked as a young man because I was so fascinated with her, and I finally ended up meeting her, and she nicknamed me my friend from the elevator because I had been on the elevator with her 65 times. <laughs> I called my mother the day I met her. I go, Mother, you're not going to believe who I met today. You're not going to believe I met Jackie Onassis today. And my mother goes, Well, thank goodness you have been obsessed with her since you were three. <laughs> um, and I did, after, after she died, I, Amy Fine Collins interviewed some people uh, for this article for Vanity Fair, and I just want to share this with you, um, again, thinking of home. At the time, this is me, me speaking, at the time when Carolina Herrera was doing fittings for Caroline's wedding dress, she brought Mrs. Onassis to our offices at Irvin and Fleming, where I was then working. She needed a few things refurbished in her apartment, so off we went. My heart was pounding when I stepped off the elevator. When the doors opened, was I surprised. I had expected Versailles, but instead I saw an apartment that was simple, restrained, perfect, grand and humble at the same time, just like she was. She had a great love for French furniture, but her taste was so quiet that unless you had some knowledge, you would never notice how fine the pieces really were. There were a lot of French and Italian old master drawings and watercolors mostly of animals. It felt like a family apartment, cozy, warm, friendly. John and Caroline's rooms were still there. She had a marvelous sense of continuity. We discussed 10 different fabrics for curtains or the upholstery, considered doing an about face for the apartment, but we'd always come back to reweaving the original or substituting it with something similar. She loved that place so much and wanted to keep it as she had always known it. And I was thinking about the ritual she had in that apartment. I did learn so much from her and so lucky as just a bumpkin to have known her. And uh, uh, one of the things, this first part of May, we've been talking about lilacs so much. First part of May, she would send Ephigenio, her butler, out to her house in Peapack, New Jersey, about 50 miles outside the city. And literally, he would take a U-Haul truck and he would, come, he would chop down like a literal forest of lilac boughs. And he would come back into the city, and for several hours he would work in her drawing room in this big Chinese vase on her mantelpiece, and he would do this colossal arrangement of, 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 of lilac branches that literally came up to the ceiling and cascaded back over you, and the scent was all over the apartment. And so for those first two weeks of May, anytime you'd go in that apartment, you'd be knocked over by the scent. 
And the first time I ever saw that ritual, because she did it every year like clockwork on the first part of May, because the lilacs only last for about three weeks. And she walked through with a cigarette in her hand, and she goes, yes, I told Ephigenio, all you have to do is put a few sprigs of lilac in a vase, and they'll all rave for days. <laughs> so here's to Mrs. Zoe. And so I, I'll uh, end this with a, a poem that was a favorite of hers. It's hard to find fault with the world, with the lilacs in bloom at the door. Then the banners of Grouchdom are furled, and life is worth living once more. The loved ones gone yonder come back to breathe once again their perfume. And joy has a clear open track when the old-fashioned lilacs in bloom. That's it. Thanks for coming. Short and sweet. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Does anyone have any questions for Keith? Any questions in the audience? Claire. Grace, Gr Gracie. Grace. Grace, Gracie and company, G-R-A-C-I-E. They're the ones who, they specialize mostly in uh, chinoiserie and Chinese wallpapers. But they, they have studios in New York and in, in, in China, and they paint. Mostly, you, you know them for the big climbing, you know, uh, Chinese papers. But you can send them any artwork or whatever, and they'll work with you to do anything. Any other questions for Keith? Well, thank you all so much for thank coming you. today. We just, a couple of months ago when, um, a couple of months ago when we were trying to figure out if we could pull this off and figuring out this sort of hybrid in-person virtual event, we just tried to get creative and we were just so excited that over time this worked out so we could do this lectures in person. And for people who came last night to the preview party, I hope you had a great time. There's another one this evening. We hope you'll come. We hope you'll check out the auction while you're here. Our co-chairs of that, Lizzie Kuhn and Karen Gonlock in the back have done a, a great job with that. So thank you so much. Um, and Catherine Kerner, if I'm not sure if she's here. Um, so they've done a great job. Um, I'd like to um, take this opportunity and ask everybody to give a huge round of applause to our co-chairs, Kim Roddy and Brett LaPere. They were brave enough to say yes and keep saying yes, even in the middle of COVID, so thank you. Um, there are books uh, that Margot and Keith are going to be signing out in the Great Hall, so we hope everybody will make their way out there and then make your way around after that to the cafe to pick up your box lunch. You can have your lunch here in the cafe. You can go out into the sculpture garden across the street. There'll be uh, tables set up there and have a picnic, or feel free to enjoy it at home. Um, but on behalf of the museum and the Garden Study Club, we just can't thank you enough for your support. And um, thank you, and we hope to see you next year. Bye. <laughs>